Hello, I'm uh, Stefan Prodan. I'm a Flux Core maintainer for a long time now. Very happy to be here with you, and I'm super excited about Alec and what he will share with us. He will tell us how um, Cisco uses Flux X scale. And after he is doing his presentation, showing us how he's using his Flux with Helm, with Customize, with advanced Git repo setups, I will um, come up with uh, some crazy ideas on how to optimize the current setup. And yeah, hopefully some of you will try these crazy ideas and will tell me afterwards if they work. Okay? Thank you. Go on. Oh, thanks, Stefan. Yeah, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Alec Carson, and I'm principal engineer in the Cisco IoT group. And uh, two years ago, I, I had to come up with a plan to deploy uh, a lot of uh, workload on Kubernetes. And uh, in our case, we have uh, a lot of uh, data centers to cover, uh, probably around a few hundred clusters. And we have not different, very uh, wide variations of type of workloads to deploy. Right? So a uh, pretty tough problem. But two years ago, there was not much documentation on how to do this with Flux. And uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, kind of show you uh, how, how we did it and uh, how it works. And um, in our case, we, we have a, a big team. Right? We have about over 200 people working on this uh, platform, uh, going from developers to testers, uh, people who release code, uh, people who are um, DevOps on SRE teams. And it was really a challenge to, to see how to build something around Flux um, that allows all these different teams to work together without, you know, uh, with as little friction as possible. Right? And, and um, in terms of, um, of, of what we're deploying, we deploy a mix of uh, open source Helm charts and uh, a lot of Helm charts developed internally, right, around a few hundred, right? And uh, on every cluster that we have to deploy to, uh, they can be different types, uh, different size. Uh, some data centers have different loads. Uh, and um, in our case, we, we had to deal with uh, you know, this variety of uh, targets. And uh, all of these data centers currently are running across the world. Uh, we have some in Europe, uh, Asia, uh, North America, uh, Middle East. And um, we also are trying to have a common model to deploy on-prem and on public cloud as well. So, so um, the other uh, concern we had is uh, you know, when you define production, you have to make sure that uh, um, not everybody can touch these uh, deployments, right? So the way to organize uh, the, the Git repositories, right, when you use Flux is very uh, critical in, in assuring that uh, you, you can control exactly what goes into production. Right? So we're going to cover all of these different um, uh, aspects. Right? So if you're new to Git, um, the first thing that you'll have to do is uh, kind of decide uh, what kind of Git repositories and what layout you're going to use, right? So if you start, there's a you know, single repo that's uh, very easy to use uh, to start with. So you know, a lot of people use single repos, and then they start adding more Helm charts, uh, more clusters, and they, they start to run into issues. Right? Like, for example, uh, as, as your team grows, uh, you'll have single repos will have a lot of commits on it. And you have a mix of commits uh, uh, coming from developers, from um, are your release teams, uh, and, it's, uh, and the problem is there. It's uh, very hard to to enforce that you know, only certain, like uh, only certain people can uh, commit to productions uh, versus uh, a task cluster. Right? And, and if you look at the Git log, it becomes a mess because uh, you have uh, maybe uh, ninety percent of your history will be uh, developers you know, testing uh, deployments, and then maybe five percent is just the production clusters. Um, so um, no, pretty much uh, the only way for you know, large scale is to have multiple Git repos. Right? And uh, multiple Git repos uh, can address most of these issues. Uh, the challenge is uh, how, how do you keep these uh, um, Git repos uh, in sync? Right? So, um, and um, the other challenge we had is um, how do you link a, a flux um, deployments to the way that you build software? Right? Um, you can have a lot of users developing, you know, changing code in Helm charts. Uh, how do you tie all of this together? Right? 
Um, the, the, the way that we do uh, in terms of Git repositories, we use uh, a two-level uh, model, right? Uh, two, two levels of uh, Git repositories. And um, what you see here is uh, on the left side, you see um, all the source code of your applications. Right? That's where 99% you know, of your code resides, right? Uh, in our case, we have one Git repo per application or per ham chart, right? And, and there you see a mix of uh, open source term charts and uh, internally developed term charts, right? And, um, and we have a CI system that builds these, uh, these term charts. So every time somebody commits something there, um, the CI kicks in and builds the Helm charts, the container images, and go into a uh, container registry and the Helm repository, right? So that's the lower side of it, right? On the right side, uh, you see uh, a lot of clusters and um, we have two types of, uh, two groups of clusters. I'd say one that's uh, all only production clusters, right? And then another group that are all the task clusters that we use for testing, right? And, uh, and for that, uh, we're going to see a little bit how these Git repos uh, work together, right? And let's start with the, uh, the level two, right? Uh, this, this is cluster, we call it uh, Blueprints uh, 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 Git repository, right? And uh, this repo contains uh, deployment instructions on typical workloads that you want to deploy on every type of cluster. Right? For example, you have two uh, examples of uh, blueprints, one that deploys um, a vault server and another one that deploys an application right? that is comprised of, uh, of several Helm charts. Right? And, um, and you see in this example, we, we deploy the, the vault uh, blueprint in one cluster in production. And then the, the application blueprint, we deploy it in three, uh, three different clusters. Right? Um, so the role of this um, uh, blueprint repository is really to contain uh, instructions of uh, how to deploy a certain type of workload, like you know, which Helm charts to deploy, uh, what are their dependencies. Um, and uh, these uh, repositories is not very big in size, maybe a few thousand lines of code. Right? It contains mostly uh, Flux, um, custom, custom resources like you know, Helm release, uh, Helm repositories. Right? And, and uh, dependencies between them. Right? So, and, and what um, the owners of these uh, GIST repositories are really people who develop applications. Right? So, developers own it, and every time they add a new Helm chart, um, they usually create a new Helm release on that Git repo, uh, and then they attach it to a, a Helm repository. Right? And, and from there, it's already to deploy uh, to any cluster. Right? So. And, and this content there is also agnostic of the target cluster, right? So, uh, because we don't, we want to reuse the same blueprint, right, on, to run on multiple type of uh, targets. Okay. Um, so this repo also, uh, we don't want uh, um, release teams or, or SRA team to touch it, right? They, all they know is that uh, there's a blueprint to deploy, and we use intensively uh, Git uh, branches and tags to, to version our, our blueprints, right? Um, next level is the level one uh, uh, Git repo. So this is really uh, uh, a place to, to link together a, a cluster and then a blueprint, right? So um, this, um, um, so we have one Git repo per, per group of clusters, right? So we have one Git repo for all the production clusters and one for all the um, test clusters, right? And clearly the production uh, Git repo, uh, only the release team, uh, SRE team can, can make commits there, right? So it's much easier to enforce uh, our roles uh, based test rates for. And then the cluster, uh, the test one is uh, developers and test, uh, they can access it and uh, they can make changes there, right? So, so in addition to, for each cluster, uh, you have one folder in that uh, Git repository and that folder contains basically a link to uh, which blueprint to use uh, which version of that blueprint to use. And it also contains the configuration parameters uh, specific to that particular cluster, right? So that's how you kind of uh, distinguish uh, what goes into each uh, Git repository. Right? And so we're going to see on the next slides um, you know, how we manage to control all these different configuration parameters, right? And then the second part is also how we, we attach our release, how, how do we release our versions of Helm charts to our deployments. Right? And uh, as you can see, there's also two different models of deployments we support. Uh, for test, uh, testers, what they want is that uh, whenever they commit something in the Helm chart, right, 
they want uh, their task cluster to update automatically to the version that they just built. Right? So this is kind of a live uh, uh, updates, right? And that's something that we will use mostly on the, on the task cluster side, right? On production clusters, uh, that's something you don't want to use, right? Um, because there you really want to, um, to make sure that whatever you deploy uh, is, is really pinned to a certain versions of Helm chart, right? And you don't want your developers to be able to you know, now, commit something that would uh, impact your production clusters. Um, so, um, in terms of um, no, how, how do you, um, you know, differentiate your, your deployments per cluster? So for, for that, we're using a feature in, in Flux which is called uh, substitution variables, right? So, it's a very nice feature that allows us to, to control exactly what we run and how we run uh, on each uh, blueprint in each cluster, right? So, to see here, so um, on the left side, we used example of one Helm chart called uh, FOD info, right? And this Helm chart has it a list of values, right? The default values with the Helm chart, right? So, and typically what you do is uh, you want to deploy this somewhere, you have to create the Helm release file, right? And that file will point to the, the Helm chart to use. And then it also contains a section called uh, spec.values that allows you to override the, the different values uh, in, in your values in your Helm chart, right? So here are examples of two different uh, fields and values that we want to, uh, to be able to customize per target, right? And there, instead of uh, putting the, the value to use for each cluster, we use a variable, right? a flux variable. And then uh, optionally, we can also put a default value, right? So, so you see that there, uh, with the default blueprint, you can end up with uh, a number of different variables, right? And then in general, when you have a blueprint, a uh, blueprint is comprised of uh, possibly uh, dozens of hundreds of Helm releases, right? And that gives you a list of, uh, of uh, flux variables, right, that you can use to customize each, uh, each target deployment, right? okay. uh, So that's on the blueprint side. On the clusters, uh, Git repo side, uh, we have, uh, that's where you define the value to use for each cluster, right, on, on each of these variables, right? And so they, this comes as form as a config map. Uh, and you see here an example of a production cluster. We, we want to override the number of replicas you know, from default to three, right? And then in the test cluster, uh, we want to do something else. We want to change the, the color of uh, one of the attributes of the Helm chart, right? And then what happens there is that when you bootstrap Flux on these uh, clusters, um, Flux is going to pick up the, the Helm chart, the Helm release, and config maps, and it's going to uh, merge everything together and then form the final uh, set of values for that particular Helm chart. Right? So it's a pretty uh, simple uh, way to, to control right? all of the values that you can use for all of your Helm charts per blueprint. Right? Um, so in terms of controlling these uh, config variables, um, um, not a lot of people use a certain way to organize their Clusters. So uh, in this case, uh, this example, uh, you have um, clusters organized by data centers, right? And then in each data center, you can have multiple clusters, right? And sure, uh, what's nice with flux variables is that you can have overlays of config maps, right? So here, for example, you can have one config map containing global variables that you want to apply to all the clusters in all data centers, right? And then for certain data centers, you also can specify uh, variables for each data center. Like for example, if you use a common uh, secret uh, store, right, you, you put the URL of that secret store, and then all of the clusters you deploy there will be using that value, right? And at the bottom, you'll have the, the cluster level uh, config map, where you can really say, uh, for this specific cluster, I want to use this specific, uh, this specific values, right? So, so this, this way to over, overlay um, multiple config maps is really um, very convenient, right? And that allows you to also repeat, uh, avoid repeating the same values for different clusters. Um, so um, the, the other side of uh, all this deployment is really how do you, uh, how do you link a, a version of your uh, applications, right? All the, the Helm charts to a certain blueprint, right? And uh, so when you point to a blueprint, you can specify either a branch or a tag, right? And, um, and when you point, in our case, when you point to a, a branch, right, uh, that means every, every time we change something in the branch, uh, that gets uh, you know, reconciled into your cluster, right? 
Well, if you, if you point to a tag, uh, then uh, it, it's really fixed to that tag, right? So uh, let's see an example of you know, a typical uh, workflow when, when you build Helm charts, right? So, so you can have like, a lot of Helm charts. Um, when, when your developer um, you know, commits something, a new version, new stable version, what happens is that uh, that Helm chart is built, right? And uh, it goes into a, a Helm repo that contains a lot of Helm charts, right? And for each Helm chart, it will also contain a lot of versions of it, right? So, and the main branch of new blueprint, um, you have a, a Helm repository that points to that live Helm repo, right? So that means, and uh, that means that uh, when you want to deploy these Helm charts on the main branch, whatever is, not, is on that Helm repo is going to get deployed on your customer, right? Uh, in the Helm release, um, you, you also specify which version of Helm chart you want to deploy. That level, you can use uh, a range, right? Like uh, greater than certain version. And that allows you to uh, kind of automatically deploy, you know, when you have new versions of Helm charts coming in your live Helm repo, they will get uh, automatically reconciled and deployed on your clusters, right? So, so that's um, the mode that we use for all the test clusters, right? And for production clusters, we use uh, a, a different way. Um, and um, there are actually two ways to, to pin the version of Helm charts to your uh, production deployments. The first one is to go to each Helm release, um, and then uh, each of them, you change the, the range version, you put the exact version to use, right? And so that's a very uh, inconvenient, because uh, as you get more Helm charts, right, you can have hundreds of them, right? It's really hard to you know, go and make sure that all hundreds of them have the right version, right? So instead what we do is that we version the Helm repositories, right? So, which means that uh, when we cut a release, uh, we, we take a snapshot of the live Helm repo. And uh, taking a snapshot means that for each Helm chart in that Helm repo, we take the latest version, right? And then we create a new repo for it, right? And then that, at that point, uh, you know, the only thing you have to do when you when create a release is you create a new branch in the blueprint directory, the repository, right? And in that branch, uh, you just change one file, which is the Helm repository. So that file, instead of pointing to your live Helm repo, you just point to the new uh, repository that you just created. Right? So, and you don't have to touch all these release files because, because uh, they're still a range, but um, you know, using that Helm uh, repository, uh, they, there's only a choice of one. Right? So, so that's why um, you can be sure that uh, that's going to be uh, pinned to certain version and that's not going to change, right? So, and, and the next time you cut a new release, or same thing, right? You, you create another snapshot, and you just change the Helm repository, right? So it's a pretty simple way to kind of make sure that, uh, you know, whatever happens in development, right? Uh, that impacts only a different Helm repository, right? And, and when you do updates in production, right? You go from, you know, release one to two, right? Between these two, you might have maybe one Helm chart that changes, or 50, right? It doesn't matter, because Forex is going to uh, just uh, reconcile and then update those that have changed. Right? Um, so the challenge is with this uh, approach uh, is that you know, when you have like two levels of Git repos, um, um, it, sometimes it gets uh, difficult to get them in sync, right? Uh, you know, Initially, when we deployed this, uh, we had a lot of uh, update failures because, for example, you can have developers add, in, add a new Helm chart and then add a new variable, right? And then in the production uh, Git repo, we forget to, to add that value, right? So that happens, or sometimes you add the wrong type, right? And in our case, we use also variables to specify a path in the secret uh, store. and dot those, those kind of uh, mistakes, or you no, know, uh, they, they can cause update failures. Right? So, uh, what we had to do there is uh, really um, uh, try to fill that gap. And uh, what we did there is really develop a small tool uh, that uh, will be in charge of uh, kind of validating your your config maps, right? And this tool, uh, we just pointed to uh, a clusters repository, and we passed to it uh, the the cluster we want to test, right? And then uh, another option is to pass out uh, which blueprint to use and which uh, tag to update to. Right? So you do this before you update, right? And that tool is going to uh, scrub all the config maps, all the, the variables, and then it will also um, connect to the blueprint and then look at the tag that's used. Uh, it, it will extract all the variables that are used there, and then it will uh, make sure that uh, all the variables that are missing uh, are pointed out. 
And uh, we also added uh, some validations in terms of uh, making sure that uh, the right type of is applied to each value, right? And for example, here you see the part info replicas, uh, there's a default value of one. So the tool is smart enough to guess that uh, you know, if you put a value to that variable, it has to be an integer, not a string, right? And, and those, um, those that don't have like, complex types, like, uh, like a color code, right? We can, we can specify um, a syntax of that variable, right? So we use a Q um, language for that. And uh, so Stefan's going to talk about a Q um, in the next slides. And, and with that tool, uh, that cut down quite a bit the number of, uh, of updates we have, uh, mistakes we have in the updates. Uh, to summarize uh, the highlights, is, um, so uh, with that kind of organization, we, we deploy to uh, currently a few hundred of clusters, and we have maybe a dozen blueprints, right? uh, about 200 time charts. And uh, we have over 200 people working on it uh, without too much issues. And uh, that's really, uh, no, uh, I, I don't think that was possible you know, using any other method, right? So, because we use intensively Git, uh, Git branches uh, to control uh, all these different uh, evolutions of uh, Helm charts that we have. Right? So, uh, the limitations of this approach is that um, you still have to write you know, a lot of boilerplate code, like for example, the Helm release. Right? probably 100, 200 lines of code. Um, so there we could use some, some tools to make this uh, less verbose, right? And uh, the, the other limitation is the flux variables are really very simple in terms of, uh, of, of values, right? They only, they only support uh, integer, boolean, and string, right? And, and when you want to do things like list or maps, uh, then you're kind of uh, on your own, right? So, that's a big issue for us for complex deployments. And as we said, you need some additional tooling to make sure that your Git repos are in sync, right? And, and some of the complex deployments we have are also require some uh, big variations of Helm chart, like for example, uh, for certain data centers, you only want a certain combination of uh, Helm charts to deploy. And from that point of view, uh, the only option is really either to patch your Helm release or, or, or to, um, there's not very, uh, very good options there, right? Or, or to add more blueprints. Right? So, and, and lastly, uh, the, the clusters, they still access to Git repos, right? So you have a lot of uh, hits on your Git repos, uh, Git servers, so, so that sometimes can be a problem if you have a lot of, uh, a lot of clusters, especially when you use, uh, you know, like um, enterprise uh, you know, Git server that are used for other purposes, right? And sometimes you can have, you no. Know, they, they can be down for maintenance and then you cannot do certain things when they are down. Right? Yep, so uh, that's uh, all for me. And um, yeah, Stefan, you want to? Yeah. See. Thanks, Alec. So we, we saw that it's quite complicated, right? <laughs> Deploying to hundreds of clusters, mixing all these apps, bundling Helm charts. It works, but it's, it's hard to comprehend how to separate. You need to iterate and create your own structure of Git repos. That's one. Second, we have this problem of Helm, which, and YAML, of course, nothing is type safe. So when you have separate uh, constructs, but on the cluster, they have to be bundled together to, to be applied, you get this unsync. Uh, feature, right? So, in my opinion, we can improve this kind of complex setup, and I don't think it applies only here for Cisco, but for many other uh, flux setups, which you know imply having a base app configuration, then deploying that to hundreds of clusters or hundreds of namespaces in many clusters. All that type of, you know, hard multi-tenancy when you have one cluster per tenant or soft multi-tenancy when you have one tenant per namespace and you always have some kind of app that needs to, you know, be slightly modified depending on where it lands. So one, one evolution improvement will be desired state consolidation. I'm going to talk two minutes about it. So we see that with, with GitOps and what Alex said, you usually use Git in your 
dev pipelines, right? Your developers push code there, then you have some CI process, and that CI process produces an artifact, and that's the thing that you are using in production. In most cases, that's a container image in Kubernetes space, right? So Kubelet does not go to your Git repo. <laughs> it does not fetch the code from there to run your app. It goes to the container registry. In the GitOps approach, you run something in your cluster, that's Flux, and Flux goes back to that Git repo. What that means is that the Git server now becomes a hard dependency of your production system, while for the development process is not a dependency of your production system. So there are a couple of challenges here. You have to make sure you can scale out Git. The more clusters you have, the more connections will go there. You need to ensure HA. You need to do upgrades. If the upgrades fail, everything fails, right? So how can we keep using Git for configuration as we use it for code? We have the same advantages. We can collaborate on it. But we don't have to have the Git thing, the Git server, as a dependency in production. And we could use the container registry. Most container registries out there right now are compatible with the OCI standard. And that means we can store there more than just container images. In our case, we can store there the Helm charts. Helm version 3 has great support for uh, container registries. You can do a Helm push. And instead of using HTTP repos, you can use the container registry and push there your charts. But for the Flux configuration, there is also this option. We have. Uh, uh, an extension in the Flux CLI which allows you to bundle your um, one or more directories or a whole repository or more repositories. It's up to you how you mix all these things together and you can produce uh, an OCI artifact for Flux. And uh, then Flux only goes to the container registry and usually those container registries are HA. You already have sorted how you upgrade it upgrading them because they are already part of your production system. What it means to migrate from, from Git to OCI artifacts, for Helm is simple. You do a Helm push, but the target is the registry. And for your Helm releases and Helm repositories, you will do a flux push. It's not that complicated. Um, there are also some API changes that you need to do in, uh, uh, in the Flux configuration. The major one is changing, switching from Git repository API to OCI repository API. But luckily, we, we created the OCI repository to be a mirror of the, of the Git repository. It's very easy to switch from one API to another and back and forth. The, the difference is in a Git repo, you have branches that Flux follows. How you can do that with OCI repositories, you have uh, mutable tags. Like, let's say, the main branch becomes the main tag. Every time you do a commit to main, you override the, the latest main uh, tag, and Flux resolves the digest of that. So like with Git, when you, go have a, you follow a branch, you resolve the commit, and in the same way, Flux for, for OCI repositories uses the latest thing, which is what's immutable is the OCI digest. So OCI Digest inside the Flux system is the same as a Git commit shell. So it's a one-on-one -on -one, uh, mapping of those. OK, so we, we figure out the first improvement. Um, the second one is about simplifying the whole, whole way of how you define variables. You merge them, and you need to do some changes which are only for data center, then only for some clusters in the data center, and so on, right? And we, we, we saw how we can do that with, um, with variable substitution and lots of lots of YAML. <laughs> uh, my proposal is instead of using Q to validate some part of the YAML, what, what Alec was showing, we can use the, the Q language which is great for, for validation. You can also use the Q language for generating the final YAMLs. And Q is a 
superset of JSON. It has a steep learning curve. You'll need to invest some time into learning queue. But once you do that, you have this powerful language where you can have complex types, you can express logic, and you can have all these variants of a particular application very well defined, type safe, in a compact form. So, why would you use Q for Kubernetes? One of the things that I really want to highlight here is the fact that Q can, the Q language can import a Kubernetes API spec being a deployment or a custom resource definition. You, it can import that. Then when you want to write a template for, let's say, a Kubernetes service or a Kubernetes deployment or any Flux custom resources, it can validate every single field in there as it was the Kubernetes, as you would have the Kubernetes API as your disposal. But is client side. You don't need to do any kind of apply Q itself, when you, when you build it, then you'll, uh, you'll get the same validation as you'd get when you apply it on the cluster, which is very powerful. You can basically validate everything way, way before it gets deployed, right? So we want to catch all these errors early on in our, uh, in our pipeline. And, and Q can do that because um, it, it, it really integrates with OpenAPI and can, and can generate these schemas for you. Okay, so we, we have the Q language that looks appealing to Kubernetes, but now how are we going to generate all these things, right? Um, so for this, I've, I'm working on a tool called Timony. Uh, it's been in development for over a year now. Um, my goal with Timony was I was so frustrated with writing Helm charts all day, so I said, okay, it needs to be a better way. Uh, I discovered Q and Timon is in, in nature, feels like Helm, but it's completely different. Uh, <laughs> uh, but it, it has the, the templates directory in there. We don't call it uh, Helm charts, we call it modules and so on. The idea with, with Timon is that it can bring the Q type safety to Kubernetes templates and can make this a more sane, pleasant way of you know, defining all these Kubernetes objects. Uh, it comes with a couple of concepts, modules, which are like Helm charts, instances, which are like Helm releases in the cluster, a bundle, which is like a Helm file, if you want, uh, or a umbrella Helm chart, and a runtime, which is something you, you tell Timony, hey, I don't want to give you secrets or give you, you know, all, all the configuration up ahead, you should look up in your cluster and fetch from there the configuration at apply time. So instead of having to pull a secret down and you know, store it in your Git repo with, with, with Timon, you say, this variable comes from this secret in the cluster at this field. And using Q, you express that query and Timon runs it and that's how it deals with, with, with secrets. Uh, I made a bunch of modules to be able to generate Flux objects, so it's release, you don't have to learn much of Timony or Q, and you can use, for example, the Flux hand release module to generate hand releases. You can generate tenants, you can generate OCI things, all the, almost all the Flux APIs, there will be at some point available at this URL, and you'll have abstractions built on top of it, and you can generate all these complex flux objects easily through Timony modules. Um, okay, so we have, we've learned Q, it's a big step, then we've learned Timony, it's even a bigger step. Uh, how we migrate now? So, it will be a hard proposal here, right? We, we actually delete all the YAMLs from Git, which is, okay? We don't store YAMLs into Git. There will be only Q definitions. Your developers will have to understand a little bit of Q and what's happening there. Um, then, but you don't, you, 
in this step, you don't get rid of Helm charts. So they can still do Helm charts, right? For now. Uh, so in the, in the blueprint repo, where you have the Helm release definitions, there you'll be having only Q code that generates Helm releases, Helm repositories, customizations, OCI repo, all the things that you need. And then how you put them all together and how you change their tiny bits for each cluster is with this bundle concept where you can refer to all the modules and say, oh, if it's this target, I'm going to change this little thing here. What, uh, what Alec was, was, uh, was showing with flux variables. Now, how you distribute all this stuff? Of course, to the OCI repo. And Timony has all these build commands, so you can do a Timony bundle build of all my variables, and you pipe that to the flux push artifact command, you push to the container registry, flux on all these clusters, see the new configuration, and starts and reconcile it. Uh, next step for Timony, there are a couple of things that are not there yet. The API is not quite stable. There are alpha APIs, so I may break them. <laughs> uh, there is a Flux IO uh, distribution for Flux where, you, where Timony can deploy Flux in a single pod. It works on the edge. It doesn't need a, a CNI, and I'm trying to promote this distribution as an alternative to the official uh, Flux distribution. It will not replace, it will be just another option. And finally, what most people are asking for is a Timony controller, so you don't have to build the YAMLs and push them to the OCI repo, push the whole Q uh, definition there. So I don't know when, when a Timony controller will happen, it all depends on adoption. What I'm asking you is like, give it a try, try to migrate the easiest Helm chart that you have to a Timony module, see how that goes. Let me know. Uh, there are lots of people who love it, but they love it because they actually are into Q, right? I, I still think there is a major gap switching from, from Helm templates to uh, Timony and Q. I, I think it's worth it. Maybe spend a day or two. Uh, and yeah, let me know. I'm, I would uh, really love to know. Thank you very much.